Welcome to The Big Unlock, where we discuss data, analytics, and emerging technologies in healthcare. Here's some of the most innovative thinkers in healthcare information technology talk about the digital transformation of healthcare and how they are driving change in their organizations. Hello again, uh, and welcome everyone to my podcast. And my it's my great privilege and honor to invite our very special guest for today, Sheila Kalkasher, Global Chief Data Ethics Officer for Axiom. Sheila, welcome to the show. Thank you, Patty. I am thrilled to be here. I am so honored to be your guest. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, before we get started on the comment, today we're going to cover a bunch of things, including what ethical data uses and uh, now the big uh, GDPR uh, compliance that is finally upon us. We'll talk about all of that, which is all very, very pertinent and topical. And before we get started, maybe for the benefit of our listeners, you could tell us a little bit about who Axiom is and what your role is within Axiom. I'd be delighted to. Of course, Axiom Corp, we we have two business units. We have our traditional Axiom business unit where we process our clients' data, transform, activate our clients' data, however they would like it processed and transformed. And then we also build data products, uh, marketing data products and risk data products, which solve things like identity authentication needs. Our other business unit is LiveRamp. And it's digital, and it's um, it offers connectivity, onboarding, distribution, and it it really enables all brands to activate their data in the digital ecosystem and reach their customers in in digital on whatever in whatever digital channel they need to be reached, and that's a very powerful and exciting capability to be able to offer all of our clients and the rest of the marketplace. So that's. That's what we are. Um, I've been here a while, and my role is data ethics officer. And in that capacity, I run a global program, uh, which is includes a global team of specialists that ensure we govern data, protect data, and honor all of the privacy protections that data and individual people need. That's a little bit about me and the global program. The notion is, and the reason we use the term data ethics is because it's more than just privacy. It really is about ensuring in every instance that we make sure the right thing happens with data, that it's not just legal, which I view as the minimum, uh, minimum obligation, but it's also just, in other words, did we interrogate the data design or data activation to ensure there's no hidden bias, discrimination, uh, potential for social harm or reputational damage? So that's what I call just. And then the fairness piece is when you have all of the facts about a data activation or data transformation surfaced, then you judge the impact of the data and you you determine, is this a fair use of data? Fair to not just me or the client or partner, of course, but fair to the individual that the data relates to. Would they agree that this is a fair and beneficial use of data about them? And that's the way we run the program. And that's what I mean by data ethics. Wow, that's, uh, that's very helpful. And very interesting too. We are at a time, Sheila, when there is a lot of concern about our personal data, data that's being collected in some cases without our complete knowledge. And a lot of big technology firms are being questioned about how they actually gather the data and how they use the data. And uh, we, we won't get too much into that, uh, but you know, we, uh, in the context of healthcare, which is where uh, I spend most of my time, and which is where now we are seeing a lot of emerging sources of data. It could be 
you know, data that's coming uh, in the form of genomics data. It could be in the form of speech data, lots of emerging data sources. This becomes a little bit uh, more complicated than when it was just electronic health records, for instance. Now I'm, I know I'm getting a little bit specific into the world of uh, healthcare data, but can you kind of paint a picture of what ethical data use means in the context of healthcare? Well, I, I think you've described the future, Patty. I think we're moving into the digital age, and the digital age is driven with data. And there is great benefit coming to humankind, but there's also a dark side if we don't govern things properly, if we don't make the right decisions. And in order to make the right decisions, you have to have a methodology. And that goes to this notion of data ethics. In the healthcare space, which I view as the most consequential to humankind in the digital age, the way that we use data to solve human health needs, potentially eradicate disease. And I, I think absolutely improve our human condition, our human well-being, and our human lives. We have at our you know, on our horizon the ability to use data in ways we've never used data before. We have data available that we've never had available before. I'll give you an example to try to light this up. One of my dear friends, Dr. George Savage, who is the inventor of Proteus, the first FDA-approved sensor-embedded med. Mm -hmm. With the sensor, we have the ability to now know and measure not just when a person took their chronic care med, but how their body is reacting in real time. In other words, is the med actually working or is there an adverse side effect happening and we can measure these things so that's huge benefit but in addition to that with with many of the population let's say i don't know pick a pick a chronic care condition let's say blood pressure high blood pressure if you could measure the way the entire population is working uh their blood pressure medicine is working then you could calibrate and improve the protocol right? You could understand all of a sudden if that med really performed or if it needed to be prescribed differently across populations, you could understand so much more. When we get to pre precision medicine and we start adding in other data streams, the potential power and value to improve human condition is staggering. Now, the notion of data ethics is this. We could also get it wrong. We could also be predatory. We could we could we could be not have enough governance and the benefits instead of accruing to the human could accrue to commercial interests at the expense of a human. We could arrive at a place where there was no place where we could be free, unobserved, natural humans. And I think that would be a travesty. So we've got to have a a construct. We, we, we have got to have an intention and then we must have a governance methodology to get it right. Right. And some of it, Patty, goes to balance, meaning um, we need data to flow so that the tools can act and we need the actors or the users of data to be fully accountable. And um, that means we have to judge each of these data flows and data uses to keep them in balance. Yeah, where are we today in this uh, in this vision that you've just outlined, where you know, data is being used to advance humankind, but at the same time we're putting in the adequate safeguards to protect privacy. Where, where are we in this continuum right now? Um, well, I think we're just at the beginning. I, I, you know, we have. We have really moved beyond big data. Big data is a hot term, but I think we're in the world of massive data and advanced analytics. We really are seeing innovation happen with things like machine learning and deep neural nets and explainable AI. And what we want to make sure is that we have our human values, this notion of data and service to people, a, it methodized in the design, in the 
in the analytics, in the data flows, and in the data activations. Um, and we're just at the beginning. One of the, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the critical importance of transparency and choice and control for the individual the data relates to. I think we should all be so transparent in an explainable and meaningful manner that any user can understand what is happening with data about themselves and have an opportunity to participate. Like one thing we may need to think about is if we are trying to understand and improve population health, data about us in a purely de-identified form might need to flow. And we might not want to enable people to choose to opt out of those flows. If it's purely de-identified and there cannot be an individual impact to the user from that data flow, but we can improve um, population health and, and maybe control disease outbreak in a way we never could before, maybe our decision is there are no choices about that data flow. But it's those kinds of granular inflection points where we have to judge the benefit of the data, the status of the data, and the rights of the individual against those flows and benefits. Right. And you talk about population health management and the identified data in the context of population health analytics which is already happening. It's been happening for a few years. A lot of the data is already captured within electronic health record systems that sit within the firewalls of uh, health systems. Now, you also talked about the digital future. Now, it's no longer entirely within the firewall of a health system. Consumerism, healthcare consumerism is on the rise. So people are now looking for digital experiences for everything from you know, as something as simple as scheduling an appointment to even getting treatment recommendations uh, over, let's say, a smartphone. And the way people are consuming healthcare is now changing uh, slowly but steadily with generational shifts and a lot of other factors. Along with this comes the notion of using multiple data sources. An example of that would be geolocational data, depending on where you are, you know, you you could be served up a set of recommendations by a digital app, you know, app that takes data about you from your electronic health record system, but also takes data about you from your location services and anything else that you may choose to share, such as your you know, something about your conditions or you know your lifestyle or anything like that. The question that arises now is who is responsible for all of this being quote unquote kosher? Right. Uh, how how does one ensure that the data is all being commingled and analyzed and served up in ways that do not violate the privacy of the individual, while at the same time delivering the the benefits? Is it in the hands of the consumer now? Is it shifting towards the consumer? Is he or she now at the center of it, or is it something else? Well, uh, I think that the consumer should be at the center, but I think the bigger obligation is this notion of accountability. So yes, data flows are global. Yes, data flows are digital, but I think we have to mandate accountability. So even when we're going cloud, even when we're going digital, those systems have to be engineered. And in the engineering layer, we need this data protection by design and default. It can't be bolted on at the end. At, it's more important than ever before in digital that we bring all of the policy considerations, all of the ethical interrogation down into the engineering design. So when you ideate, you need to interrogate. When you design, you must re-interrogate. When you begin to activate, you need to validate. It has to happen in the engineering layer. This is what they call privacy by design or in GDPR terms, data protection by design. And that is what I call data ethics by design. 
that's uh, that's that's very well said. That's very well said, Sheila. Now oh, that's a great segue into the other topic we were going to go into: GDPR. Uh, went into effect on last month, 25th of May, I believe, and now everyone. Uh, everyone who has some kind of data flowing through the EU in very broad and simplistic terms is covered under GDPR. Is that correct? Um, well, GDPR, of course, is an update of the, of the European Union Data Protection Directive, and it is a pan-European law, and it has the changes. One of the changes are that it's extra jurisdictional. So its scope is it covers any European Union personal data that is processed anywhere in the world. So if you're processing EU personal data in the U.S., that is in scope. If you're processing it in Shanghai, that is in scope. So the next thing we all need to do is understand what is EU personal data. And the way I like to think about it and explain it is EU personal data is any data that relates to a single user. It's my name, address, email, phone numbers, and any other attendant attributes that go with that data set. But it's also the bit and byte data. It's also a cookie ID, a mobile ID, a customer ID, because it relates to a single user. So that's the data that's in scope for GDPR. So now that's pretty all-encompassing, right? It's... Uh... Is broad enough in scope that uh, pretty much anything could be covered. You know, any form of uh, data use uh, could be covered under the GDPR, and, and, and any violation uh, carries significant penalties associated with it. So, what are you know what are regular organizations supposed to be doing about this? And I can tell you, I get some 20 notifications every day from all kinds of providers that I didn't even know that I was dealing with telling me that they have not that they have now updated their policies and their GDPR compliant what does it mean for the common man or woman and what does it mean for you know US businesses especially those that on the surface of it don't have anything to do with the EU let's take healthcare as an example you know health systems in the, in the United States don't really deal with European patients and they're pretty much confined to the US. So, but at the same time, they're using all the data for, you know, marketing to consumers and so on. So, uh, I know I threw in a lot of things in there, but can you kind of touch on some of them? Oh, sure. I, I think those are all such smart questions, Patty. Thank you. Um, well, for an individual, what it means is GDPR offered expanded data subject rights. Of course, data subject is, is European parlance for the individual. So there's expanded rights, not just notice, but a very updated, transparent, specified notice, a GDPR level notice, so that's new. Um, there is um, access, which we've always had, but now there's some a shorter time frame for enterprises uh, to uh, respond to access requests. Then there's correction, limitation, deletion, portability. So there's new rights for the data subject. That's one. Number two, um, GDPR is at its heart a, a um, an accountability law. It's an accountability and data governance and record keeping law. Because remember, part of GDPR requires demonstrability and inspectability. So you've got to keep records. What does this mean for a U.S. entity? A U.S. entity that is processing EU personal data is in scope. So it needs to undertake a self-exam to determine <clears throat> if it's processing EU personal data. And if it is, then it's got to remediate and ensure that um, it's processing the data and offering the data subject full rights. So it's processing the data in accordance with GDPR. Um, you know, I, I was pretty fortunate. We've at here where I work, we have had a data governance program where we actually govern the data in the engineering layer. That's the way we've operated for a very, very long time. So for us, GDPR was a catalyst um, to, to do an inventory and improve our systems and processes and record keeping. But for that hadn't really thought about this before, um, they've, they've started at ground zero and they've had to design that, not just do 
um, an inventory, but essentially do a design process and stand up a data governance program. I, I think some of the larger entities with more resources, it's not been quite as hard on them. Uh, for some of the mid-tier and small tier, it has been. It's It certainly has been a resource intensive effort for me. Uh, but it, it, it does bring a level of transparency and accountability to the marketplace. And I think that goes to trust. And I think that's very, very important. We do want a trusted marketplace, especially a trusted digital marketplace, because we're all more digital every day. And in the future, that is going to be how we uh, how our, our commercial markets work for the most part. So I think this is an important new law that we all need to pay attention to. What, what about healthcare? Uh, is there a, is there a specific twist or nuance uh, that you know healthcare, especially U.S. healthcare enterprises, health systems that uh, you know are, don't really manage European patients, for instance? Is there a nuance or twist here that they should be looking at? Or in general, uh, U.S. corporations that don't have anything to do with the EU, should they be worried about this at all, or, or is it just business as usual? Um, it's. I would argue it's not business as usual. Um, because there's it, GDPR is, is essentially more specific even than our own U.S. HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Right. So, so if a U.S. health system has EU personal data, this is sort of the first analysis. Um, under the law, under GDPR, there's a notion called incidental. So if it happens that a U.S. health system or health network is they're U.S. focused. They're not EU focused, but they, first, you know, and this happens in the world of data. They have a few EU records, but they're not monetizing or commercializing or activating that data. Then, then it's incidental, and there's an exception under the law. But they need to undertake a legal analysis of that construct in the law to determine if they can operate. And let me give you an example. In part of my business. Um, Part of my business thought that their EU data records were incidental. Then we evaluated it. And what we determined was my business noted that the records in their U.S. file were European. And they bundled that into a European product. And they treated it as a European product. And they monetized it as a European product. I cannot claim incidental if I'm doing that, even though the data collection is happening in the U.S. by a U.S. entity. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. the first thing, first thing a U.S. healthcare provider needs to do is undertake a self exam and analysis to determine how much EU personal data they have and what they're doing with it. That then will inform their obligations or their next steps. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I, I know this is uh, early days yet in the rollout of uh, of GDPR, and, and I'm sure we're going to see a, a lot of questions come up, and and uh, we're going, you know, it's just a start. Uh, well, we're at the uh, top of the half hour, and I, I wish we could continue, but uh, you know, there's there's so much more to discuss. But but I really appreciate your sharing your thoughts uh, here, Sheila, and uh, I'm sure our our audience is going to find this very very interesting and useful. So, uh, thank you so much for your time, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you, Patty. I'm delighted to be with you. Have a great week. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Subscribe to our podcast series at www.thebigunlock.com and write to us at info at thebigunlock.com.